Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on this beautiful blue planet. I've done this presentation a couple times before. I, I try to send the links to use Zoom so you can just tune in or even call in if you just want to listen. But I got an enormous amount of messages. I said, hey, I didn't have a chance to jump in on your Thursday night uh, presentations. I did them a couple weeks in a row. So could you send me a copy or whatnot? So I don't really record those because that's not what I do. Those are private conversations. So I'm going to go ahead and re-record this here for everybody to take a look at. You know, so many people have asked, like, what's happening with this tidal event, perhaps, that's coming in October of 24 here in a few more months. Like, what would be the trigger for it? It could be the same triggers. There'd be a lot more earthquakes. Uh, what would we see? Some tidal events that would disrupt shipping. You start to see ready-made excuses around the world why shipping's already being delayed. Uh, things are not being delivered by seaport. You know, our American ports are quite empty right now. You listen to Jim Willie talking about how, uh, you know, the U.S. bonds not being as wanted for, you know, payment on delivery for a container ship to roll into port. That they're not requiring oil, so there's a lot more oil tankers there so they could direct ship. So it's actually barter now. <laughs> you give me a good, I'll give you a bigger good. So we see the same old history repeats. Instead of using treasury bills, we're trading off uh, super tankers of oil. I keep talking about these cycles coming in and out again. Here's one. The Theater of Plants. This is uh, London, 1640. Now, as we go through this, it's going to be delving into religion, but don't think about religion as the Bible itself being interpreted as the Bible itself. What we need to do is look at the characters included within the Bible as archetypes for something else that had to have been disguised during the Inquisitions. This information is age is old past. So when the painters would come forward and try to encode and re-encode the information from the 1200s, 1300s, 1500s, 1600s, they used the biblical figures to represent the celestial bodies in space. Now they could get away with that. Just like today, you got to run the razor thin line of what disinformation, misinformation could be construed as. So the obviously Adam, Adam and Eve, King, King Solomon, you know, these are biblical archetypes that are well known. If you ask somebody to name the top 10 characters or 10 figures from the Bible, these two would pop up for sure. So if you take a look at Adam and you think about the reset, what would a reset look like from our modern world? Well, this is exactly it. We'd have shovels again to grow our food. We go back to the garden. That's it. That is the archetype of a post reset world. Whatever type of cataclysm it is, don't care. It is a post reset world archetype. Now, if we look at King Solomon and we look at the actual completion of Solomon's temple, that was 959. So I just try to use that as a mark. So how would you mark time? The completion of something of that vast of a scale would also be like the completion of our world today. We've reached the apex of our civilization probably five years ago before COVID, maybe a little earlier, depending on who you want to talk to. But it seems like we're at that apex and we're quickly dropping off in many places in the world. But just as an overall societal thing, there's nobody uh, that's not getting banged by inflation and just everything, less choice, higher prices, except for very few select countries. So if you look at the world at the apex of where we could come with technology, mathematics, communications, etc., that would be King Solomon. The reset taking us back to the gardens again is Adam. The Fed took the punch bowl away from the party again. The stock market's been betting on March rate cuts, but not so fast. Is this why JP Morgan and UBS are calling for a 23% drop in the S&P? The recession indicators ringing its most severe alarm in 40 years. Either you think Bidenomics is working, isn't it time you protected your retirement with gold? Call the proud Americans of the Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late. Mention the ADAPT2030 channel, you're gonna get some great in-class service. Also, Patriot Gold Group has a no fee for life IRA where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold or silver. No fee for life IRA on qualifying rollovers. Give them a call 888-546-7020. 
And also now for the seventh year in a row, Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs top rated IRA gold dealer, 888-546-7020. And now on with the video. So when you start to look at these, do a little math, calculation, approximate 4,000 BC or 3964, however you like to put that. He says the Bible references it and puts it in there, encoded in itself as a timestamp. We would be looking at a 3,000 year cycle. So within the Bible, it already encoded by the by the, just the characters themselves and the time span between a post reset world and an apex world of the post reset coming out of and then rebuilding into. So that's a 3,000 year cycle. So what was being told to us? So when we start to look at these. So, you know, signs in the skies or lineups in, in the planetary bodies. So this is what's coming in October of 2024. We get these four gas giants. They're going to be in a square formation in one quadrant in the outer solar system. The last time it happened was 79 AD. So you look at this and you go, okay, well, that's a 2000 year cycle. So the last thing we saw was a 3000 year encoded cycle. So that's why I was into the Grand Solar Minimum, thinking this would be one of the triggers for it causing large volcanic eruptions, which again have more particulates in the atmosphere, which cause cooling. You know, the sun's going to do its thing with the electromagnetic fields, triggering other events here on our planet that in turn hit that feedback loop that rolls back into cooling. And it's real interesting how suddenly they're talking about the AMOC shutting down. And somehow that's going to trigger a day after tomorrow event. And then uh, the other hand, they're like, oh, global warming, we've got to do a green agenda. You need to give trillions per year, but we're going to be swinging into a cooler world where none of those solar panels will work nearly as efficiently with ash in the air and more cloud cover. You already see precipitation patterns moving greatly. That's why there's record floods everywhere. So this is an indication of the onset somewhere in this configuration is going to reach at least an apex of the two. Remember, the next one will come out in 2028 or so. And not only that, we see it encoded in other religions as well. You know, you could look at the Kabbalah and the Tree of Life, and we get this formation here where you plug the gas giants into those four, and then the ego, the self, Atma is also the sun. The lower self plugs in where the earth be. Now, there's something very special, even where we look for Venus is down on the, on the bottom right there. So this is the beginning of the cycle. Now, remember, it's always two pieces. It's two keys. So this is the key that unlocks the beginning of the cycle. Now, once these planets loop around and we get that bottom configuration where Napjet and Goof are, then that would be the completion of the cycle. So as above, so below. So it's an inverted mirror image of how these are going to set up each other. I'm trying to find the completion date, but, you know, I'm just trying to figure out more what's happening with the tides first. So you can see it's encoded not only biblical, uh, text on time frames, but it's also in the Torah and also some of these more further back, shall we say, religions. I'm sure if I went to the Colburn Bible, I could find something as well. You know, Indian Vedic texts talk about these cycles time immemorial. That's nothing new for them. But in terms of finding physical planetary geometry that's matching with something, well, there it is in front of you. So again, uh, and when we're talking about in religion today, we're looking for the archetypes of the characters of the Bible that you could hide from the church burning you alive, uh, how would you do that? Well, this is not Mary and the baby Jesus. That is the sun. And the earth is what is being protected. And you see those glowing halos. Those are electromagnetic fields that are contained within us. Us as in beings, but also our planet and the connections between the sun and the earth. Now, once you start to look at it in this way, that that is the sun and the earth, not Mary and the baby Jesus. Then you would start to look at, all right, well, if I'm looking for the four planets somewhere, I should start to find those encoded as well. So how would you hide the information from those who were trying to destroy you with time and pass that information? You know, those were called secret societies back in the day. Now, were they the same psychopathic characters that there are today, perhaps? But they were definitely trying to hide the knowledge through directly in front of you, d hidden in plain sight. So what you're seeing is Jupiter on the left here and Saturn on the right. Now, another way you can look at this uh, is they're holding the staffs and circular staff. They're, they're, those are planets. 
All right, so you look at Jupiter, it's always been called the protector from time memorial, like this beast, it's an incredible power figure up in the heavens, right? Zeus and the lightning bolts, well, well, you got the beard and you got the pineal gland right there on the shoulder, you got the encoding of the pyramids. And what you have on the right there is Saturn. Now, is it a glowing halo over the head or are those the rings of Saturn in skies? These are the way I would do, I would do the exact same thing. And I got to wonder on his bottom, is he holding keys of time? I'm not sure. So let's zoom in on it a second here. You can clearly see, are those the rings of Saturn? You know, a borderline, you could disguise the information right in front there like that. And nobody would even blink an eye at this painting. But for me, it says, here's Jupiter and Saturn described far back in time. Now, also, if you're looking at the outer gas giants, which they said were not discovered until the 1800s, I don't believe that because there's so many references to Sumerians Counting the planets from the outer planets inward to what was Tiamat and then here to the Earth. So there, these planets were there. This is, we just rediscovered it. Like source maps of old, they knew North America was there already and then they discovered it. Okay, so you already know those planets up there, so you're going to put archetypes to them. And here we are, we have the four gas giants right here, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. But encoded as the spiritual figureheads saints for a better term and i love how they're holding the keys of time again and the birth and rebirth and regrowth right there so we start to get all these archetypes again rolling through so these are the four gas giants and then we have the sun and the earth as jesus and mary so we're starting to look for configurations of all these squished together somewhere that would allow us to know that they knew they were sending us a message Hey, look for this sign in the sky when you see it. This is what we're looking for, October 23rd to the 25th. And even if that, just imagine this for a second. This configuration here, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, even if it only had the equivalent of all the electromagnetics and the tug and gravity and all these things of just our moon. So that we have the equivalent of two moons in the sky, for a better term. How would that change our tides? Just on that point alone. Just on that point alone. And you start to look through history of all the times that ports have like magically been silted in and then things just disappear and then a port's like a mile inland suddenly. What had happened? Land subsistence, water flowing over, unknown. We'll take a look at that in a second here, but here we go, clean to see. I was actually got the revelation of all this sitting in the same church where this uh, painting was at. This is a postcard that they offered at the little offering. So there you have the sun. And then you have the Earth. But then you have Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus and Neptune in that same square configuration. Shall I show you again? Let me go back one slide. It's the same exact thing. They encoded it. They, they had to. They had to hide it. So then once you start to see this, you're like, hmm, all right, light bulb goes off. Like, there's, there must be more. If there was one and it truly was a code, there should be a couple more. And they should be in plain sight, like literally, like right in front of you. And what do we see again? Boom. The exact same thing. These uh, four gas giants here in the same configuration. Now, this one was from 1490, 1493. I should have written the date down. Um, I got thousands of photos going through in museums and things. But the only thing I can't figure out is why this time the outer planets of Uranus and Neptune are holding the staffs. But I don't see that. You can barely see the circular at the very top there. Part of this uh, fresco is missing. But I, I don't understand why the reverse this time, why they're holding the uh, the poles, unless those have something to do with like a Zeus lightning bolt, where that is the description of a flow of electromagnetism changing state from one planet or the outer planets to sort of the uh, middle inner planets. Or think about how you'd represent that. Could you draw a Birkeland current for me? Okay, and then we have this. Uh, this was in Venice. Uh, in the castle was at Doge's Palace. Mary Jesus, okay, Earth, Sun. And then we got the two there, and a little bit further out, you got two more of the uh, gas giants, so slightly offset. Depends on how you look at that angle also. If you were truly there and you were trying to visualize it, it would sort of be off, similar to what we see in that square formation. Uh, encoding the information once more. 
And the glowing halos are kind of what gave it away. Originally, I did think maybe it was, but then these are crowns, coronas. And when I saw that, I thought, oh, they just, it's the sun. Clearly, it's the sun. It's a corona, coronavirus, huh? That's are quirky. And then this is in the basilica right downtown. This is the biggest basilica, and supposedly it's set on millions of wooden poles. Then they put two layers of stone and built the most grandiose uh, basilica slash cathedral on top of that, just on wooden sticks, 75 feet down into the ocean, into the mud, right on the clay layer. That's at least the story of Venice being built. Uh, yeah, I don't believe that at all. But what do we see again? In plain sight, the sun and the earth and the four gas giants step down. This is a two for one, because if you didn't see that and didn't understand the iconography, well, they uh, did a two for on this. Do you actually see it? Okay, you got the outer marble statues, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And then we got the inners as well. So if you didn't see it on the outside, you get that same configuration, four with the sun and the earth in the center. So if you didn't get the message once, it's a possibility you could get it twice. And, uh, you know, right, again, right, totally out in the open. I mean, no, no other way to do it. So then I went to the Nautical Museum, and I... You know, I saw the description of it, like, this old dusty thing hasn't been curated since the 1980s. And I thought, oh, i got to go there because obviously they're going to have forts, like star forts and different kind of boats and flags and kind of thing. But this shocked me because on this huge long wall, they had all these pictures of these wave anomalies. And see, I had known this before, so that one of the reasons going down coastals areas now is strictly looking for uh, tidal anomalies that are referenced in prior cycles that have been cataloged and they show like a trigger for it. So then it's kind of quirky. So I'm looking for these four gas giants. And then what do we see here? The, the four that are causing some sort of wave disturbance. Some might say that, yeah, these are the patron saints that they were, you know, giving homage to, to keep their voyages safe or whatnot. Okay. But every painting here, the voyages are not safe. So they're definitely showing you a different messaging. So we got four gas giants triggering some sort of tidal or wave action. And, uh, you know, you're looking at the same sort of thing here. I mean, whatever it is, you're getting sets of four and different. And look at the waves. They look so strange, the waves. And all these paintings are from, say, like 1650s up to early 1800s. But another thing was these are source paintings, like the originals. We're just copied and repainted and maybe something else put in by the latest painter on top of that. Same with like the Perry Reese map, you know, those are all source maps. So this is the uh, wall that I was talking about. And look, everywhere you go, look down there, there's always figures at the top of some sort. Got the star fort there with a dragon flag on the one bringing in waves with uh, some sort of astronomical alignments that are causing unusual uh, tides or tidal flows. Now this doesn't have to happen very long on our planet a week or two, a week before, three days before, three days after, and our coastal areas would be disrupted. It would take us a decade or more to clean this out and, and uh, bring our world back to where it is or where it was. What, what do we see again here? Uh, I see the same thing. We get the, the four, uh, you know, with the halos and this sort of thing. Those are electromagnetic fields, in my opinion. But again, what is if these are supposed to be patron saints blessing you with a peaceful and safe voyage, then why is every one of them a shipwreck scene? That's the whole thing that was interesting. Now this one here, that thing that you see kind of on the right side, that yellowish thing, it looks like a, this painting had been uh, destroyed or, or soaked by water and they retouched the painting up in those two areas. There were two other things there, but the curator would, didn't really know what they were because they had to retouch this painting and they did it quite some time ago. But we get the fours again, the four. I think they're signaling four gas giants, this sort of thing. Um, there's that, you know, wall, which could have been a fort of sorts coming in. And it looks like, I wouldn't say tsunami waves, but you just get stacking waves. This kind of wave pattern is really, really rare to see in nature. I mean, there's usually some duration of seconds between them. That's like a half a second. Like when you go surfing and you're looking for the big swells to come in, you're looking for like 21 second. Oh my gosh, you get a 21 second interval coming in, that's going to be gigantic. So if you get anything like 18 seconds, you know it's going to be big, like super big out of Hawaii. 
Uh, but this is like a half second duration. It's just like one after another, after another, after another. very strange wind pattern. And you could say, yeah, I see this when a gale blows in, but not at this size and, and continuously re-messaging again and again and again through the same paintings. These things appear in the sky, tide and ocean get strange and ships are wrecked. That's the messaging through all of these. If this was a postage stamp collection, it would be the planetary alignment shipwreck collection is basically what it is. And then you start to look now, you got to think also the transference of electromagnetism. Would something glow brighter that you could see with your eyes? Because sailors, you know, they're very attuned into uh, celestial navigation. So they would be the first ones to notice that something was glowing brighter, like a planet, perhaps. Do you think? And again, but you get the same things again and again when these, and you could look at the halo across that one on the right there is just, like the plasma filaments coming off of it. And those two in the center, again, some of these paintings were damaged and they were trying to repaint them and touch them up. And you can see where the touch-ups were right in exactly 12 o'clock position. There were two more of something there that uh, were, were wiped out in the uh, reconstruction or the repainting. Again, massive waves. And I'll draw your attention to the right up there with the monk holding the cross. Now, is that the galactic cross where we're moving out of one age into another? Because it's rather strange that they had the focal point of that. There you go. I'll bring it in. But what do you see in the background is the erupting volcanoes at the same exact time. This would make sense because we're going to get to the electromagnetic changes at the same time that wind patterns would change on the planet, driving different tidal flows with just wind, the tides themselves coming in and out at higher duration, double, triple height going out, you know, two times lower, three times lower. You would expect a huge amount of volcanoes to be going off at the same time. Now, it's really quirky how they put all this into the same. And then you got, you know, the monk or priest holding up a cross. Obviously, is this a disguise of the galactic cross? Because the original Rosarian cross, the Knights of Malta, was a perfect cross square. It wasn't elongated on one end. It was a perfect square or cross. So that would be a reference to they understood the, the celestial crossings and when a crossing would occur, nasty things happen on our planet. Now, again, I want you to be I want you to go back into the late 1600s and then describe to me when you see a planet glow brighter. How would you how would you describe that? Well, for me, I would do the same thing. Fire like something's glowing brighter. It's burning hotter. So obviously they're trying to explain that something out there. It's hotter and brighter, and it's affecting, again, the waves here. Now, these people look a little bit happier in, although there's an over, there's a capsized boat in the center of it, and it looks like they're life rafts, like I'd be happy if I was on a life raft after a capsized vessel also. Again, it's too quirky that all these paintings had the exact same themes to them of shipwrecks, glowing bodies in the skies and in the hands up there. Dozens and dozens of these. And uh, Nana, thanks for, you know, giving me the idea here. So when I did the original presentation, uh, somebody on the call was like, those are like those square waves. You know when you see crossing tides and they tell you, if you see what looks like square ripples out in the water, do not get in. That's the most dangerous currents of all. Way more dangerous than a rip current. If you just go out the rip current and then blast off right or left and you come back in. Like if you surf, you're looking for the rip and get you out. You know, to such a big long paddle out, get pounded. Just take the expressway out there. But if you're seeing those crossing wave pattern, uh, what she said, it, it represented because she'd seen this kind of wave pattern before. But usually when you see it, not at this enormity, like this is like orders of magnitude way above anything that we've seen in today's world of this kind of square pattern crossing flows uh, on tides coming in. That's going to be an extremely, da extremely dangerous ocean. And, you know, we start to see it again and again. Um, and one other thing that I kept seeing, too, was this bird reference. Not everywhere. Not everywhere. Usually back to the time of Taurus, leading to Aries, like there was a lot of these, they encoded timestamps with the Zodiac on it. Bird winged reference. Well, if you look at Wormwood in the Bible, they talk about it, it looks like a, a winged you know, planet coming in. 
it's just strange waves every time you see these glowing things with coronas and crowns and, and thing in the heavens there. Has to be something to it. Now, this was by far the oldest one. This went back to like 1460. Again, you get the, the winged destroyer, if for a better term, and then obviously you have some heavenly body. It looks like it's coming, approaching at you. And what do you see under there? Taurus. This is definitely a source from long ago that they kept the same elements and just replicated it, but you get the weird waves again. This one seems to go much further back in time, like six to 6,000 years prior, especially if you're going to be referencing Taurus in the paintings. You're talking, you know, multi-thousand years way further back than something that was repainted in the 1400s. You're talking about 3,500 to 4,500 years going back as a source to get this information. That's what I kept seeing again and again. And uh, when I keep talking about the iconography here, even there's references of the time of Leo. And a lot of that were in Venice. Everything was lion. The whole Italian uh, black nobility and all these things, they're all lions, especially on their coat of arms. Their whole heraldry for every family that was there included an enormous amount of lions. Going back to the time of Leo, and the German houses always had the eagle on the left. And then once the houses came together and the Venetian uh, nobility took, then they got the double-headed eagle out of Austria and then obviously through Venice or the Venetians. Huge amounts of money was transferred up there. Also, I see a star for it in the back. And then we come right to the time of Taurus again. There's like time skips in, in the zodiac signs. So what I meant by that when I was saying there was missing time is you got Leo and then you're missing Cancer and Gemini. And then suddenly it's at Taurus again. So again, they're showing you like 4,000 missing years of history. Is that the message that actually the time that we think time is, is not as long. I'm just throwing it out there for some uh, discussions. Because where we sit right now across, literally on the cross, across from Aquarius is where we are. And it depends who you talk to in the astrological realms. Are we really in Aquarius or are we doing it by the rising in the actual star sign itself on the ecliptic, or are we just using 2,000 years of time or what, 72 years for one degree moving around so it's an equal distribution of time? This is where it gets sticky. Of are we in Aquarius or are we not? Depending on how you tally up time, or do you tally it going through the star sign completely? Because then some of the star signs would be 2,700 years versus just in a, a pretty much even you know, 2100 years, something like this. So if we're looking at the great year. It just depends. And this is where it gets, like I say, a little sticky with the uh, time stamps on these paintings and really, truly, which time did these events occur? Because all the, one, one thing through the realm there was there was the pre-reset pre paintings where everything was immaculate and all the arches and the domes were just perfect. Bustling cities. And then you come to the post reset where the arches are crumbled or like trees growing out of things. And it says people walk back into a destroyed city and just try to, you know, move the rubble out of the way, do the best they could there. So this is from Verona here. And, you know, during these times, if there were something that would cause tidal action, then we should be looking along rivers also to see, in addition to tidal ports, like I did that whole series of, the old Roman port that is now 1.8 miles inland. So, you know, these things just don't make sense on a normal time scale when we're taught about how, how fast deposition layers occur. You're only talking a few thousand years to, to, the, to the Roman period. And you're telling me that that silted in, you know, 1.8 miles where they're, they couldn't just like dig it out day by day. They had people working there. You, okay, go dig out the channel. Like they didn't have the workforce to dig out the channel. Even though it was silting in, they couldn't just dig it out. That makes no sense how it went to such a minimal population where nothing could be done. And now we're looking at, you know, 1.8 miles inland. If you look at the airport going into Rome, look for that hexagonal lake there. That was the final destination where boats would come to. So I'm looking at the rivers here and this is inland, uh, but it connects to a huge lake called Garda Lake. This is in North Italy. What do you see right there? Well, I see the deposition layer of something on top of the original layer. It's clean as day right there. You're looking at two layers of time. So the deposition layer was what, 10 feet deep on top of that? 
And uh, this was a book that took photos from Verona in the like 1860s to say 1890, 1900s, something like that. So here we are, we're looking at something in the face. So Verona, great city to go to. There's a huge amount of uh, things to explore there. They got layers upon layers of history there. When I say that, it, you go down 12 feet and they're finding other layers of what we consider like the ancient Romans. So something happened here significant of this lake draining out over down that river basin, which is, by the way, not in the same place anymore. That river exits out into that lake in a very different spot than it did several thousand years ago. But you have the lake, and this is what had flooded, back flooded all the way to Verona there. So looking into some maps here, Verona, this is 1574. Now the Verona, you can see it kind of reddish and it follows the river. Now what you want to look at there is the city at the bottom, probably like the four o'clock position coming out of the lake. There's a set of star forts there right now that are on the coastal edge. And this was a fortified city that was on an island, set of islands actually that were interconnected, refilled in and then made in the middle of this uh, river right there coming out of into. And then we just jump in time to 1776. So we see a Verona still over there on the right red. But now look at the bottom of the lake. A, the contour has changed. But B, that star fort's out in, like I say, it's there's one little sliver of an edge that's on the uh, that's visible now that's on the coastline. How did that contour change so much is a question. Like what caused that massive change from that time before? I'll, I'll re rewind it there for you. From 1574, clearly that that thing is way inland. And it's 1776, and then it's not. So there was definitely that reset occurred during that time. I'm trying to narrow it down by trying to find maps that show the same thing, but like chop 50 years off this edge, chop 50 years off that edge, and see if we can narrow it down a little bit better. So here's another thing that um, blue mines, if you will. So this is a really famous bridge uh, that's in Verona. And they were there was a drought for a couple of years, and they're like, well, there's a drought. Let's just try to refurbish the foundations there. So they thought that they were at the bottom layer. You see where the larger uh, blocks are that are shaped like a ship. They thought they were at the bottom layer already. And what did they find beneath that? Another whole layer that was already pre-quarried. So something for them, uh, they found another cultural layer below what they thought was the base of the bridge for its uh, you know, rock layer or whatever layer in that that thought was at the very base of that. But you can clearly see below that they'd already found already quarried uh, stones that are much larger than the ones that were laid in place. And this bridge had been there with since the 1300s or so. So you're going further back in time. So to construct that bridge in the 1300s, that uh, sort of ship shaped stones, that was 1300s forward. So below that, you know, who, who was doing that kind of engineering far back in time is the question, because that's what they found once they took the de deposited silt away from there. Somebody had already been working on that rock and they didn't know that. And that was the whole shocker for them, that they thought the base layer was that, you know, slab at the very bottom right there. So wh what's going on with this? And they're trying to reshore up what was already there. That's not carving out. That's reshoring up. So that something was already there. Uh, also, when you look at the deposited silt along the, the river wall, which has been reconstructed completely, but look, at, you can see some of the openings right there in front of the uh, small Colosseum. And again, a little bit wider out view here of the deposition, and you can see the buildings where there, it looks like there's, you know, some, some archways are not completely uh, unburied. And here's what I mean, like there's a huge amount of debris inside these archways. And, you know, how long would it take you to unbury that after, I think about 1776, between 1550 and 1776, that reset occurred. They're still here in the late 1800s and they still haven't removed all the damage and all the debris yet. So you can see in a cultural context, how long it would take. Now those sticks right there, that's the infilling of a, of a sea wall or a river wall that is now what you know is the wall in, that goes along the river in Verona. But they were are, are starting to put that in to try to dry this out to then clean all those areas out. That took 
a good, what, 150 years for them to get enough extra manpower and have enough children that actually grew to adults to have a labor pool to get to that point where they had enough food where then they could solve problems? That's quite some time for a reset. Now, here's what it looks like after it was cleaned out. That's an enormous amount of silting and debris inflow into there. So you're looking at a good 10 to 12 feet from that lake that we saw further afield there. And uh, yeah, the restoration project went really well. But then they covered a lot of this over in the newest restoration project. And here's another uh, strange one. In the 1870, this is the Coliseum. Well, you're looking at that third layer out there was previously built by a previous builder civilization that had the technology to go at least one to two levels higher that they could not replicate with the ancient Romans. That's why they left it at two levels. They didn't have the technology to replicate a three to floor, a three to four floored uh, amphitheater. So this smaller one that you see here holds 30,000 people. The other one that they were saying at least 100 and 120,000 people, depending on how it would have been built. But you got to put that in context. The ancient Romans, who were supposedly the best builders of their day, couldn't replicate what was already built there because it was so superior and so large in scale that it just, they couldn't. So that's why you have the two pieces there. And another thing, I don't see anybody. Now, you go down there today, this is like the centerpiece of the centerpiece of town, which it would have been back then too. But I don't see anybody there. Which is a strange thing, you know, they keep talking about all these pictures without people around the world. And, uh, you know, then they started excavating inside some of the canals that were inside the city or next to the river leading into a little canal in the city there. 1895, and what do we see? We see bricked out uh, archways again. That would have been from the other side after the mud flow or debris flow, and then they would have bricked it from the inside to prevent water from coming in and still use that building from the other side. So what was going on there also is a question. And finally, you got a decently sized workforce where you can get in there with shovels and wheelbarrows, obviously, and then excavate. Now, this is not a super giant excavation where. And uh, the three dots that appeared in the video, uh, I've had other people say, oh, no, it was from the ferry that was passing directly in front of the other ferry. But I'm like, dude, the mass that thing would have to be like two to three hundred feet tall. So I did, we didn't hear any helicopter sounds. We didn't hear anything. I didn't even notice these changing lights until, you know, later on when I was doing, I didn't even see it during the editing. So, you know, a bunch of you wrote in and said, you see those lights in your video? That was like B-roll while I was explaining some, you know, prior history. So anyway, this is the first this type of presentation that I'm putting together here. And I do hope that it, um, you know, fills in a couple blanks that we can trace down some of these reset times. And what's the trigger for it? If there was one approximately 2,000 years ago, or 79 AD, there's a lot of disruption right around the year, say 50 to 100, like a huge amount of disruption. The world got reset back then. And then we see another one that's visible through maps and also through deposition from somewhere, you know, late 1500s to middle 1600s. That was another one. So they seem to occur, and you can pinpoint two of them at least, Hey, listen, this last one star sign here of uh, Pisces. So where does it go from here? That's the whole question because I'm trying to dig in and really figure out what's the trigger for this. But thanks for watching the presentation. I got another one um, I'm working on right now. I know you'll enjoy it too. Bye for now.